There's a popular story that radiometric dating is reliable and accurate. We looked at this in episode 28 and saw that this story was very weak. But now it's really crumbling. Let's just have a quick recap. There are many assumptions in radiometric dating. Some methods need more than others, but all need some very basic assumptions. Let's look at just a few. Assumption 1. Samples must be homogeneous. The parent element, uranium for example, and the daughter, the element that the parent decays into, in this case lead, must be evenly distributed throughout the sample. As we saw in episode 28, Henry Fowl pointed out long ago that uranium and lead both migrate in geologic time and useful ages cannot be obtained with them. Widely divergent ages can be measured from samples of the same spot. Pieces chipped from one rock can give ages from almost nothing to many millions of years. Plausible stories and excuses have been thought up to explain away the problem, but you have to want to believe them to be convinced. Assumption 2. The initial and final quantities of the parent and daughter isotopes must be known. The final quantities of those isotopes can be measured with great accuracy. The initial quantities can never be measured at all. They must be estimated, or should we say guesstimated. Believers in radiometric dating have convinced themselves they can make good guesses, but they can never be checked because they can never be measured. Assumption 3. There's been no contamination by other parent or daughter elements. But not only do uranium and lead migrate, as Fowl pointed out, but some elements important for dating, like argon, move very quickly and easily. Again, believers find ways to convince themselves that they have the problem under control. Assumption 4. The rate of decay of the isotopes has always been the same. But as we saw in episode 25, Frederick B. Jerniman noted, There has been, in recent years, the horrible realisation that radio decay rates are not as constant as previously thought, nor are they immune to environmental influences. And this could mean that the atomic clocks are reset during some global disaster, and events which brought the Mesozoic to a close may not be 65 million years ago, but rather within the age and memory of man. Believers have stamped and performed and shrugged this off, but there are people like me who remain sceptical. Assumption 5. The samples have not been affected by external factors like heat, pressure or chemical reactions. Almost all radiometric dating is done on volcanic rocks, but it's been found that in magma in underground magma chambers, there are very different conditions in different places in the same magma melt. Different temperatures leading to fractional crystallization, different rates of chemical reaction and other processes. There are very substantial variations in concentrations of elements, including parent and daughter elements, in various places in the magma chambers. The radiometric believers tend to be as dismissive, strident, as confident as the young lady we met in the previous episode. They come up with reasons for their confidence in brushing aside these assumptions. And they've been doing so for so long that they know from experience that most radiometric doubters will be cowed into silence. They loudly proclaim that nobody who knows anything about science could possibly doubt the accuracy of their dates. 
But let's just look at what an expert from the Max Planck Institute had to say. When writing for fellow radiometric believers in a believers-only journal. The isotopic composition of lead in the rocks of the earth as a whole has been a source of enduring mystery. Do you ever hear the radiometric believers admitting anything like that in public? One possible solution to the conundrum is the existence of a complementary reservoir of un radiogenic lead. Several candidates have been proposed, but a satisfactory solution is yet to be found. Well, why not just accept the observations at face value instead of looking for ways to ignore them? But, well, you see, they simply do not add up to the sum that would allow the bulk of the terrestrial lead isotopes to fit the standard model of an Earth built about 4.5 billion years ago. And perhaps even more surprising, he points out that one hopeful candidate in Japan, although the massif was emplaced only 23 million years ago, the unradiogenic nature of the lead contained in the body suggests that this mantle domain is at least a billion years old. Can you guess where the 23 million years came from? Radiometric dating. And the at least a billion years for the same geologic formation. Radiometric dating. Hoffman flounders about trying to find other reservoirs which might lead to a credible solution to the radiometric conundrum. But eventually he admits that nobody can find one. Now, as we've already seen, one of the key problems for the radiometric dating fiasco is the second assumption, the starting conditions. We can measure the final ratios of the isotopes, but we can never measure them at the start. C. Knight sent a link in the chat to some findings which really throw some light on the story. A lot of people have been working on a process called cold fusion since the end of World War II. In principle, the process is to enclose some electrically charged gas, called plasma, in a tube surrounded by a lot of electric coils. A powerful current is passed through the plasma. A very strong pulse of electricity is passed through the coils. This creates a very strong magnetic field. The plasma is squeezed or pinched, and it becomes so hot that the particles of the plasma clash into each other at great speed. A burst of particles comes flying out and smash into the elements strategically placed to catch them. When an element catches one of these particles, it becomes the next heaviest element on the atomic ladder. The process is known as transmutation of elements. For a long time, the process looked as if it didn't produce enough neutrons to do much atom building. But recently, some tricks have been discovered which make them produce far more. Some big, powerful, cold fusion devices have been made in various countries. A famous Polish-American physicist, Ludwig Kowalski, worked on one of the biggest in America and produced very interesting results for iron. Iron has four naturally occurring isotopes. 91.7% is iron-56. 2.2% is iron-57. 5.8% is iron-54. And iron-58 is very rare, only 0.3%. The isotopes were produced in the same ratios as found in nature. Kowalski moved to a cold fusion lab in Ukraine, where he worked on all kinds of elements, 
Quite a few did not produce the same ratios of isotopes as found in nature, sometimes more, sometimes less, but they all produced the isotopes. Now, the most trusted radiometric dating method is uranium, thorium, lead. Let's see what the Oxford reference has to say about that method. Throughout geologic time, the isotopic composition of lead in the earth has evolved from that of primordial lead by the addition of radiogenic leads, lead 206, 207 and 208 derived from uranium and thorium decay. Lead 204 is not derived from any radioactive parent and appears to be a standard against which the other lead values can be compared. It is normally assumed that in any small part of the Earth's crust or the underlying mantle, which at the time of formation contained primordial lead, together with uranium and thorium, no radiogenic lead could have been present. With the passage of time, atoms of radiogenic lead, 206, 207 and 208, gradually replaced uranium and thorium atoms. These same people assumed that the heavy elements, like lead, were formed pretty much as they are formed in the fusion laboratory by particles being smashed together at great speed, presumably in something like a supposed supernova explosion. So how much confidence have we that all those other isotopes were created solely by uranium and thorium decay over billions of years? The evidence that we have suggests that the majority were probably created when the lead 204 was created, in which case the contribution from uranium and thorium could be trivial. Those billions of years they confidently tell us about could disappear in a puff of smoke. And then again, the James Webb Telescope observations have trashed the last vestiges of the Big Bang and its timescale. Observations showing the sun to be liquid, probably metallic hydrogen, trash all the ideas in astronomy which were built on stars being balls of gas. So looking to astronomy for guidance is probably not at all reliable. And recent work analysing zircon crystals, the radiometric data's favourite source of dates, throw doubt on their whole story of the Earth's creation. Let's look at that next time. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, Please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.